Hello there and welcome to the official EFL podcast as we steam towards the end of another gloriously chaotic season. We've a treat in store as the Championship's leading goal scorer Sammy Spoddix drops by to discuss his goal-laden campaign. You know, you score a couple of goals and your confidence goes up and, you know, everyone starts talking about you and, you know, as a footballer, who doesn't like to be to be spoken about? Um, and I think as games have gone on and, you know, you're playing for such a big team like Blackburn, you're on the telly more, you know, you're, you're, you're over social media, you know, I think it's like... Probably this season, I would say I've I've probably focused and really concentrated a lot more on my football. A key voice at Sky Sports describing all of the upcoming drama is David Stowell. He's back to co-host. And to top it all off, we'll bring you highlights of last Sunday's EFL Awards. If you haven't already subscribed, then please get following and find us in all the usual places, wherever you get your podcasts from. Or if, like David Bowie, Sound and Vision is your thing, watch it all on YouTube. This is the official EFL podcast. A very warm welcome to you all. This season is absolutely flying past. There's only a few episodes of the podcast left as the season draws to a thundering climax. Uh, for this week, I've got co-host back once again, David Starr from Sky Sports. Stowley, how are you? I'm very well, Pratt. So I must say did a fine job on Sunday at the EFL Awards presenting. It was, uh, it was a great watch. Thank you so much. Your voice of God was warm, rich and soothing as it always is. Did you enjoy yourself? <laughs> Had a whale of a time. Absolutely loved it. It was an honour to be involved. And uh, we had a great night, I think. And we we, uh, we, we saw did. some wonderful winners crowned as well. We did. And that is the perfect segue because you are the perfect co-host into talking <laughs> to one of those winners. Um, he's only the top scorer in the Championship. 30 goals in all competitions this season. It is just a pleasure to have Blackburn Rovers Sammy Smoddix with us. Sammy, how are you? Yeah, all good. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure, mate. It's nice to, to, to be able to sit down and chat. We've, we've both admired you from afar for such a long period of time, especially more so this season. Um, has any of it taken you by surprise? Was it all in the plan? Did you see it coming? Do you know what? I sat down with my agent at the beginning of the season and, you know, drew up a plan for, for goal contributions. And, you know, I think we passed that in, in October. Um, so, I, yeah, so it's been a bit of a surprise to me this season with the amount of goals I've scored. Um, but it's not been a surprise that I have scored because, you know, every level I've played, I've always scored goals. Um, but, you know, to do it in a, such a competitive league like the Championship is is probably a bit of a surprise to myself. Um, and, you know, it's something I always knew I could do. Mm. And at the at the old at the old age of 28, finally, you know, I've got the chance in the league and and um, I'm scoring goals. From that point of view, of, of you mentioned your age because obviously... Football, I mean, you get anywhere near 30, people start thinking you're really old. But what comes with age is maturity, uh, maturity of thought, um, composure. Have you found that that's been potentially part of it? Everything coming together at exactly the right time? It's amazing to think that you actually sat down and planned out what you wanted, but then to actually do it. I mean, that's another thing altogether, isn't it? I think this season especially, you know, last year was my was my first year at Blackburn. Um, and, you know, in the summer we lost a lot of big mature names at, at Blackburn and you like to Bradley Dak, Dan Ayala. Um, and I felt like it was a bit of a duty of mine being one of the oldest players at 28 because it's such a young team to to step up off the pitch. Um, and I think that maturity is just sort of just reflected onto the pitch. Um, and I've, I've, I've sort of grown up off the pitch and it's, it's carried its way onto the pitch and that's why I'm putting in these performances. And, you know, the goals are just a bonus for me. Um, you know, I think scoring so early on in the season mm -hmm. um you know scoring a brace at Rotherham I think second or third game in sort of kick-started my season and the confidence just grew from then on and you know with three games to go but you know hitting the 30 mark last weekend uh, was massive for me and hopefully I can add a couple more in the last three games I don't know whether you were aware of of your numbers over the past few years Sammy because obviously you you know as as Pratt says we've we've watched and admired your play at Peterborough and then obviously you got the move to Blackburn and and, and all of that but you've scored the same number of goals this season as you have in the previous three campaigns combined. So what's what's sort of clicked? I mean, I know you've played a bit further at the pitch to a point, so obviously there'll, there'll be more opportunities, but there's it's more to it than that, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it, it's tough. I was on Talk Sport yesterday or the day before and I got asked the same question. It's mm -hmm. quite a tough question to answer because I'm sort of playing in that free freedom role where it's sort of like you can do whatever you want. So I can sort of go wherever I want. Um which is why I'm enjoying my football so much because it's sort of just like a free-flowing game. And like I mentioned, you know, you score a couple of goals and your confidence goes up and, you know, everyone starts talking about you. And, you know, as a footballer, who doesn't like to be to be spoken about? Um, and I think as games have gone on and, you know, you're playing for such a big team like Blackburn, you're on the telly more, you know, mm. you're, you're, you're over social media. You know, I think it's like probably this season, I would say I've, 
I've probably focused and really concentrated a lot more on my football. Um, obviously, previous years I have as well, but just being at a club and being one of the main players and one of the oldest players at Blackburn, I've just felt like it's a lot, not serious, because every season's been serious for me, but it's been a lot more to sort of take in and, you know, a lot more people are watching your games. And I don't know if that's just reflected. And like I mentioned earlier, my maturity has is, 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 is followed that and, and with that's come confidence and with that's come goals. Um, so it's quite hard to, to put my finger on it, really. It's, it, it sounds like the, the kind of thing that happens to a player when everything, a lot of boxes are ticked at the same time. So I, I think what it sounds like you're trying to say is it's a sense of responsibility. Like you say, big names go out the door, Ben goes out, out the door, Bradley Dack goes out the door. We saw Adam Armstrong move in years gone by at Blackburn and it needs people to step forward and you've done exactly that because, I mean, the fact that you've got somebody like Alan Shearer getting in touch to say congratulations just goes to show the magnitude of that football club and what it means to so many, many people. So is that is the next port of call for you getting this season boxed off and then those type of goals firing a team at the other end of the table over the course of a season? Yeah, every footballer wants to be at the other end. You know, it's been it's been a bit of a roller coaster season for me. Mm. Uh, you know, on a personal one, it's been my best ever. But we're down with we're five points off relegation, and we've been down there sort of most of the season. Um, and like you said, it comes with responsibility. I feel I still feel at twenty eight, I'm, I'm relatively young. I've still mm. got so much more to give. And you look at the football club. Now you've got youngsters playing. Even even the other night with Archie Gray being eighteen, like I don't feel ten years older than him, but I am. And it's like it, it's crazy to think that that was once me. And you know, with responsibility, obviously, I've got a young family now. Um, you know, we've all we've all moved up to the northwest of Manchester area. And again, it comes with that, maturing. I mean, that comes into as well, doesn't it? Given where you are, because uh, you, you are. I mean, Colchester's miles away. I mean, I played there. It's, it's miles away from anywhere. And I mean that with the greatest respect. It's, yeah. it's a trek, isn't it? And so yeah. to move across on the other side of the country, that's that's a tough thing for a footballer to get his head around. I think, I think one of the main things for me was I went to Bristol City as a 22-year-old from Colchester and I probably wasn't ready to move away from home. And I wasn't ready and I wasn't physical enough and I probably wasn't good enough at that point to play in the championship. Um, so I remember going to Peterborough, dropping down a league, which... I, I know a lot of people wouldn't do. They'd be happy to just stay at Bristol because you, you're at a champ team. And I felt like it was right for me to drop down a league to to sort of work myself up because it's it's like going from League 1 to the Premier League. It would be a big jump. And going from League 2 to the champ was a big jump for me. And I felt I should have been given more of an opportunity. Um, but I found it tough. And dropped down to Peterborough in League 1. Sort of showed my worth there. And then obviously got into the Championship with Peterborough and we had a tough time. So moving to Blackburn, I, I always felt like I had a like a point to prove um, you know people sort of questioning are you good enough at that level and first six months last year at Blackburn found it tough obviously with Yondal Thomason um, the way he played was really different to how I'd ever played and I think a lot of the boys were the same and then once you understood how he wanted to do it it was so tactically quite easy for you he made the game so easy um, and I think down to him is probably while I was playing my best football and I finished the I finished the season last last season really strong and I've just taken that 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 confidence and and that form into this year it must be it must be a tough sort of um, mental tug of war, I guess, when you're doing as well as you're doing, posting the numbers you're posting, but in a side, as you say, which has really struggled this season. So, for example, you've scored in 19 championship games, but Blackburn Rovers have only won eight of those. So is that mm. a difficult thing to sort of manage personally in the dressing room where you've maybe come in and you've scored a couple of goals in a game or you've scored a goal in a game and yet the team hasn't won to sort of have that that sort of smile on your face on a personal level, but then realise obviously the team hasn't done the business, so therefore you're, you know, you're struggling. Yeah, of course, because like I said, on a personal level for me, it's amazing. And, you know, it's so hard to score goals. So to be scoring them at this level is fantastic. But like you said, most important is to get the win. And what I've found difficult sometimes is, you know, I might not have the best game, um, but you, you score the win or you score a goal and you sort of half done your job. And what I found difficult is sometimes going in, it's quite, it's easier sometimes when you've lost to not have scored because, you know, sometimes it's hard to go into the change room after the game and sort of say, ah, throw your hands in the air and say, lads, like, come on, because people think, okay, mate, you've scored a couple yeah, of yeah. goals. <laughs> um, yeah. Sometimes it's actually easier to go in and have lost 2-0 because mm. then everyone can sort of have a pop. When you've, when you've lost 2-1 and you've scored, I don't want people to think like, all right, mate, you scored a couple of goals. You think you can come in here and have a sh- scream and a shout, which obviously no one thinks that, and I'm, and I'm not like that. But these are the sort of thoughts that go through your head. And, and like I said, for me personally, I might never hit this many goals ever again. And, you know, my name to be even be mentioned the same as Alan Shearer and, you know, to get a video from him is like a pinch myself moment because 
I just love playing football and I'm surprised like you know we spoke about it at Blackburn you know when I score now like we, we sort of have a laugh and a joke and I get people texting me like oh my god like how have you scored again and it's like I always knew I'd score goals but to this level and this many is sort of surprising for myself and yeah it's just finding that balance of you know being happy because you're doing your job and scoring your goals but ultimately you know I think you know maybe with one more point three more points from the last game mm. we'll be safe from from the relegation zone so it's just a bit of a, a bit of a roller coaster at the minute it's 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 so funny you should say that. So I'm just picturing so many <coughs> excuse me strikers that I've played with that would come in and do exactly that. Any chance, lads? Oh, well done, mate. Yeah, got a goal. And, <laughs> and you know the worst is sometimes the manager was going, "Is anyone going to help him out and score?" And I'm sort of sat there like. So then when the manager leaves, everyone goes, "All right, scored a couple of goals already." And you're like, "Oh." And all you can game. do is go, "Lads, I'm so sorry. I'm not asking you to say." Because then you can sort of half batter and say, no, no. "Lads, he's right, and he's dangerous. Someone helping me out." Like, like, <laughs> Um, but yeah, Headlines it does it, it, does it on his own again. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking, oh, this is so embarrassing. But I would say, to be fair, John Eustace has come in. We were leaking goals left, right, and yeah. centre. Um, and John Eustace has come in, and the first thing he said was, right, we're going to stop. We were playing a four at the back, and he's come in, he's three at the back, five at the back, and mm. we've, we've shored it up completely. And I think just the, the performance at Leeds on, on Saturday mm. at half 12, just sort of what we've been working on for weeks sort of just clicked I and mean, we're a good counter, counter-attacking team and it, the, the game plan worked down to a T so he's come in and he's completely different to Yondal Thomason but you know the way he wants to do things has definitely shored us up and this is why we're sort of picking up the points now where we're picking them up You mentioned that as a footballer you, you kind of always like to be talked about because I mean, that's the nature of the beast isn't it and in the industry that we're in do you ever find that some people get your name badly wrong <laughs> because I think some people look at a name with a Z in it for example and panic and then say something yeah. that isn't quite correct. So I bet over the years, we talked to Connor Hurahan a, a, a while ago, or Harahan, I should say, to get it right, um, <laughs> right at the beginning of this podcast journey, mm. this this season. And he said he'd had all sorts of, of sort of uh, pronunciations of his name. So as a commentator, we always try and get it right, but I'm, I'm guessing yeah. some people don't. Oh, I get all sorts. Yeah, I get all sorts. They, they, like you said, it's the right way to say it. They, they do panic when they see the Z. And I think some people think I'm going to have the most wildest Hungarian a- accent ever. <laughs> and I probably couldn't be any more Essex or common. So when people talk, I, I even remember meeting my missus when I was 18. I met her. And I think she thought I was going to have some wild accent. And she was like, oh, like you, you speak in an Essex accent. I'm thinking, yeah, just because my surname is not from, from England doesn't mean I don't speak with that accent. Um, but the Z does panic people. It's just it's just smodics. It's quite simple when you actually know how to say it. Yeah. A lot of people say smodics and I think like, oh, you're just complicating it. So, But to be fair, as a commentator, I can, I can imagine it's quite tough because written down, it does look a bit wild. Going back to what you said about scoring goals and making plans. And it being this wonderfully stellar kind of standard setting season, what do you do then to carry on? What what takes it into next season? How do you how do you maintain what you've got, on, and if not, push on further? Yeah, it's it's been a bit wild. Um, I knew it was a big season for me after finishing last season so strong, and you know, it, it, I didn't know how it was going to go. I'll be honest. When Yondal left, because. I felt like I was I was only really, really understanding his football and playing my best football. Mm. You know what it's like. The manager leaves, a new manager comes in straight away. Is he having me? Does he like the way I do yeah. things? And I've sort of kicked on again under under John. It's tardy, obviously, you've got Jon and you've got John. Um, <laughs> I've kicked on again under John, um, which I've thoroughly enjoyed doing. And, you know, um, no one wants to be down there. No one wants to be down in a relegation battle. You know, last year we was we was top at Christmas. Mm. Um, or year before, shall I say, we was top at Christmas. And obviously now we're... We're hoping to get safe this weekend if results go our way and it's like two different levels, you know, ends of the spectrum and mm. everyone wants to be at the top of the table, you know, fighting. So, you know, next season, be at Blackburn. If I'm not at Blackburn, be somewhere where I'm pushing for a promotion and I'm not... It's a hard one. You want to be out your comfort zone. You don't yeah. want to get comfortable anywhere. You you always want to be challenging. You always want to be like... I remember signing for Bristol City and thinking, I'm never, ever going to get in this team. You know, there's three or four players that play in that. In that, when I signed, it was like Andy Vyman, Jamie Patterson, Casey Palmer. There were yeah. some proper names there, and it was like they're the teams you want to go to, and you know, really get your name out there. And I think this season, I've noticed, especially my name is sort of everywhere, and it's like you said, it's good to be spoken about, and it's good to to show people like I've moved from League Two down to the National League, back to League Two to League One. Now in the Championship, it's just nice to sort of have played in every EFL league uh, and and done well. And international football as well, of course, because your late grandmother was Irish. So you're, even though you're um, from Colchester and you're a West Ham fan, 
you've yeah. you're you're playing for Ireland these days. So how have you found all that? Yeah, you know, it's been a long time coming that debut. I, I sorted my passport four or five years ago. Um, you know, growing up, just being from Colchester, playing for Colchester, my dad. We didn't we didn't really know how far down the line. You know, you could you could play for Republic of Ireland. Um, Nan died at an, an early age. I didn't really know her, so again, didn't know how it worked. Um, and it was only with a new agent that I signed with five years ago that he said, oh, "I think we we could look into it." And obviously, international football for me was was what everyone wants to do. Um, and you know, things happened with my passport, and then things happened with the old manager. Um, I don't think he knew. He thought I wanted to be there, um, which obviously I did. And then uh, this this camp just gone John O'Shea obviously got it for, mm. for a while and he and he rang me up and said would you be interested in it um, basically you're going to get an opportunity and I went there and I absolutely loved every minute of it I started both games got unlucky with the Switzerland game um, but loved every minute of it and I'm looking forward to the camp in, in June So from that point of view as well Sammy you, you talk about the, the kind of points that you need and the re- results potentially being able to get it boxed off this weekend it, yeah. it's that strange kind of purgatory that you're in isn't it because as a player you want you want to you almost kind of say look well let me play these games back to back let's get all, let's get it all done let's get let's mm-hmm. play friday saturday sunday get it all done so we know by monday exactly where we are but you've got to play you've got to wait you've got to play you've got to wait it, it's tough isn't it because the end of the season is is there but yeah. you've still got a huge job to do between now and the end of that season well that's why i think it sounds mental, but you'd have heard it before. We, we went to Bristol City on the Wednesday night. We lost 5-0. Mm. It's probably the best thing that could have happened to us because we went there um, after a couple of good results thinking we could just go to, to Bristol City and turn up and they walloped us. They beat us 5-0 mm. and it's probably the best thing to happen because we needed a reaction and there was no tougher place to go than Ellen Road. And we was on Sky, so straight away everyone's talking Leeds this, Leeds that. Yeah. Understandably, with where they are and where, where we are. Um, and the manager sort of just said to us, like, no one thinks we're going to come here and get absolutely anything, so why can't we get a win? That was sort of the team talk. And obviously we've done really well, we got the win. And the finish line is in like is in sight, we can see it. But like you said, our, um, we play Sunday, so obviously all the games Saturday will be done, all the results will be done. Sometimes that builds a little bit more pressure on us. Yeah. You know, sometimes you like to play early on the Saturday or on the Friday night because you know... You can just focus on your job and your job's done. You know, we'll be watching Saturday, hoping the results go our way. But ultimately, we can only focus on ourselves. Um, you know, hopefully we can get a good result Sunday. And it leads nicely into the next weekend for, for our last home game at Ewood Park. I guess, um, Sammy, when you were playing that, that game against Leeds, I mean, you, you're right. I suppose the wider football world thought, well, Leeds are going to win this because they're pushing to try and get up and you've just lost at Bristol City and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So when you turn up to a game like that, how difficult is it to not be another one of those people who thinks, well, we've got no chance today and, and to actually sort of focus on the job in hand and believe in yourself as a person, but also in the group? Yeah, no, of course. It's 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 a no-brainer. We, all, we obviously knew all the chat was going to be about Leeds. Leeds have had a fantastic season. Obviously, some of the winning player of the, player of the season, you know, the, mm. I think three of them was in the team of the season, you know, and there's, there's no surprises there. They're a great team. It's probably one of the best teams we've played this season. Um but, you know, we, we went there with no pressure. No one's expecting you to, to win. We, ourselves, we're not expecting to go there and win the game. We're expecting, we're good enough. We know we can hold out and get a point. Um, but the manager drilled it into us all week. Sort of, why can't we Why can't we go there and cause an upset? You know, they, they need a win as bad as we do. Um, and the game plan worked down to a T. It's exactly what we were going to, how we were going to do it. It was going to do a low block and invite the pressure. We knew we was going to play five at the back. And, you know, the defenders have been so good this second half of the season since since John Eustace has come in. Um, and we knew we, with our quality going forward, we would get them on the counter-attack. And I think the goal came in the 82nd minute, um, which was, you know, we're, we're a very fit team, a young team, um, and we can keep going. And I think we showed great character to to react after that Bristol City game. Well, Sammy, like we said, the end of the season is very much in sight, mate. But on a personal note, congratulations. As I said, we, we love covering this division. We love getting to the games. And to see what you've done, mate, has been has been staggering. We would just wish it Thank you. Uh, all the best for the rest of it, and also to carry on into next season, mate. Yeah, thanks a lot. It's been a it's been a good season. So hopefully, I can I can see that golden boot. Adam Armstrong's got it in him to score. <laughs> He's got it in him to score two <laughs> hat tricks. I, <laughs> I was watching his games last night with my fingers crossed, thinking just 
you can keep getting your assists, Armour, but don't score any more goals. Um, so, you know, the finishing line's in sight now, but I appreciate no, that. Thank you. Brilliant, mate. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, live from a, a, a car park somewhere in the northwest. We can't tell you where. It's a top secret location, <laughs> but we really appreciate taking the time, mate. Thank Wonderful you. Stuff. Cheers. So, Cheers, Sammy, Sam. we'll let you go. David Stowell, I'm going to let you have a little break now. Of course, you were working at the EFL Awards, as you mentioned, on Sunday night. Sammy was a winner. Right now, we can hear from a few more of the winners on the evening. I played 871 games. It's... You can't even fathom what, how long ago when I started. Uh, to Northampton, to Forest, unbelievable. To Ipswich, where is my home now? Ten years there. Top ten all-time appearances for them. We had some amazing times, some good teams in a very tough period for the club. My um, relationship with everyone in that area is fantastic. Um, and then on to Colchester, where it's a different experience for me. In the last couple of years, I was making sure I was going out every Saturday when you walk around the pitch before the game, just taking it all in, because you know it's going to come to an end at one point. I probably still could play now in terms of my, how my body feels and fitness, but I thought it was the right time to finish. And, and that was a really perfect thing for me to finish there and play every game and go out on my terms. So I can't, I wouldn't change anything for the world. We've challenged for the last three seasons. We've uh, missed out on the playoff final in, you know, a couple of seasons ago. Uh, missed out by one goal last year in the, to reach the playoffs. So we, we feel it's our time this season. Uh, but it's just keep trying to improve the squad each season uh, and try and improve the way you play. We needed to concede less goals. We've done that. Um, but fortunately, we've scored a few more as well. The Portsmouth fans over the last 15 years have, have gone through a fair bit, going through you know, the, the top in the Premier League, winning the FA Cup, all the way down to being hours from going into liquidation and falling out of the Football League. So for them to be able to, I guess, experience um, a bit more, a, a bit of success would be amazing. It would mean the world to myself, everybody connected to the football club, and most importantly, I think the fans to give them a bit of reward for. I think all of the hardship they've been through, and um, you know, it's a, it's a football club that I, you know, sometimes you get this said a bit flippantly, but I think it's a football club that definitely belongs uh, in the championship at least. So hopefully we can take them there. It's been exciting. Um, of course, there's, there's ups and downs along the way. Every game's so competitive, the margins are tight, but um, you know, we're enjoying it. It's been a fantastic season. It's first season for the club back in the championship in four years. Um, this is, you know, what we wanted to do. We knew it was going to be tough, um, but we wanted to get back to the championship as quick as possible. We wanted to make an impact and start fighting at the top of it as, as quick as possible. Of course, I don't think anyone really expected it to happen this quickly. Um, but, you know, that's uh, that's been a lot of good work and a lot of hard work. But, um, you know, we're, we're still we're still three big league games left and there's still a lot to fight for. And, and uh, you know, that's where our focus is. But, look, whatever happens, it's, um, you know, the... The trajectory of the club's in a lot better place than it was, you know, a few years ago, and that's that's great for everyone. I think the future of the, the club is in a good way now. So a little snippet there of the EFL Awards on Sunday night, which was a thing of beauty. It was a glorious night for everyone to come together in celebration. Um, some worthy winners as well. Luke Chambers, we were working together at the Norwich Ipswich game just a couple of weeks ago, and he said he was popping along. And he, he was mentioning very vaguely about an award he thought he was up for. <laughs> I don't think he realised the magnitude of what he was going to get, which was a wonderful reflection of the Sir Tom Finney Award of, of a very, very long career. Um, Kieran McKenna, wonderful job that he's doing. John Messina, more of him on him shortly, because just when he thought his week couldn't get any better, it quite clearly did, didn't it, Stella? We'll talk about him <laughs> in just a sec. And of course, Nigel Clough, he's been on the podcast before. 25 years doing what he's done, dedicating that to his wife, which I thought was the loveliest of touches uh, up there on the stage. But as I said, let's get cracking with news that's even more up to date than Sunday night at Grosvenor House, my friend. Um, straight into the championship, straight into the top end of the championship. Now, where we find Ipswich, manager of the year, Kieran McKenna, his Ipswich town at the top of the tree. Leicester City lost, Leeds lost because of a certain Sammy Smodic, who we had the pleasure of talking to just a few moments ago. By the way, what a lovely fellow he is. Mm. Um, they seem to be falling over themselves not to, be, <laughs> to become the champions. And throw into the mix, Stowley, Southampton. Welcome back, Southampton, into that race for the top two. Yeah, I mean, we've talked before, haven't we, on this podcast about how brilliant the championship has been this year. I and mean, we seem to be a bit of a broken record in that sense because <laughs> every year we go on about how great the championship is. But I, we haven't seen a promotion race quite like this. Um, I think it's incredible to think that those teams that you mentioned, Ipswich, Leicester and Leeds, were in such a rush to get promotion sealed. And in the last few weeks, it's almost as if 
suddenly no one wants to do it anymore and <laughs> actually they don't want to go to the Premier League. They love the Championship too much. Um, it's become such a congested race. And then, as you say, Russell Martin and Southampton have just come up the inside and are now right tucked in behind. And you think, that what well, they've got a game in hand on Leeds United. If they win that, they're level in points with Leeds, which makes the race for automatic promotion crazy. And of course, two of those four mm. will drop into the playoffs uh, and face teams who are in good form themselves, like of Norwich, who've come out mm. of nowhere almost to get up there and stay in there. West Brom, who've done brilliantly yeah. throughout the course of the season, bearing in mind all the, the various issues there. Mm. So, I mean, it's just going to be an incredible ending. And I, I can't wait for the games to come. You'll kind of look at a, uh, the diary and see there's no game today. You've got to wait a couple of days. And it's quite mm. disappointing because you want to all <laughs> keep going. That's the race for the top two. That battle for fifth and sixth. I, I would possibly say that West Brom... Maybe just being dragged into that, given, of course, how close Norwich are. And then, of course, a wonderful result for Hull City, who needed themselves to kind of throw themselves out the funk they'd got in of drawing games. Um, let's move further down, because, again, that's not sorted. One thing is sorted, of course, Rotherham, playing League One football once again next season. Liam Richardson, uh, we were told, to all intents and purposes, after relegation had been confirmed, that he would be the man to lead them back. He's now not. He's moved on. And there's a very, very familiar face back in South Yorkshire, isn't there? Yeah, there's two two strands to this, I guess. There's the Liam Richardson exit and the entrance of Steve Evans. So let's let's deal with Liam first. And mm-hmm. the news did surprise me here because I spoke to Liam, uh, what, about 10 days ago. I, I was covering the Rotherham United-Plymouth Argyle game, mm-hmm. which obviously was the night that Rotherham succumbed to relegation. So I spoke to Liam a couple of days before the game and, and he sort of mentioned a few things to him, which he'd said in the, in the press. It's not, it's not a case of mentioning, um, you know, digging Liam out in any way, but he sort mm-hmm. of said that since he'd arrived at the club, he'd been managing a situation more than just a team. There'd been various yeah. underlying issues at Rotherham United that needed sorting out. Um, and he, I think one of the problems that he felt he'd had since being in charge was that he'd only sort of had a 65% availability of squad, say, mm. during the games that he'd had, either through illness or injury or or various other things as well. Um, and so he hadn't been able to name an unchanged team and get that rhythm going that you really mm. need when you're at the foot of the table and struggling. And, and, and let's be honest, as a club, they've not been good enough this year. Mm. I mean, you know, sometimes... You, you can look at things and, 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 and dress things up a little bit. Ultimately, if you double Rotherham's points tally, they're only two points clear of relegation. Yeah. So it's just not been good enough. But he'd had positive conversations with Tony Stewart about next season. It looked like he was going to have the opportunity to put the his, his sort of own stamp on the squad. There were a lot yeah. of players out of contract, so there's going to be a lot of turnover. Um, and he was looking forward to the challenge. But clearly in the sort of week or so that's passed since then, things have changed on either side of the fence or, or, or on one side of the fence. And um, and a change has been made. No surprise that Steve Evans has been lifted out of Stevenage by someone because yeah. he's done such a brilliant job there. Very swift, of course, isn't it? Yeah, and, mm. and he's got very uh, very good history with Rotherham. Of course, he, he led them up from League Two to the Championship in his first spell. And, and we spoke to him on the pod a, a few months back. And I think when they, when they first when he first joined Rotherham, um, they were 19th in League Two and he had a meal with Tony Stewart and he talked about this on the podcast with us and Tony said to him, where will we be three years today, Steve? And Steve admitted he was a bit cocky and sort of said, well, <laughs> three years from now, we'll be, in the, we'll be in the championship. And um, Tony said, if you get us there, I'll pay you bonuses and I'll buy you a Bentley. And um, and Steve said to us, didn't he? He still got the Bentley. Um, <laughs> so that was how, how the relationship blossomed and the success that they had. And of course, other cars are available incidentally. Um, <laughs> But he, he he mentioned to us he was proud of his his reputation for getting clubs into a better place, mm. um, and uh, and that he sort of feels that if he'd been a bit more mature and, and calm at some periods of his career, he wouldn't be managing in League One with Stevenage, and that's yeah. all due respect to Stevenage. He'd be higher up the order, so he, he clearly sees this as an opportunity to get Rotherham back into the Championship mm. and to move on up up the pecking order, and and, and all the best to him and indeed to yeah. Liam as well. Yeah, very much so. And it, sometimes, I mean, it's a tough one, isn't it? Because it's a brutal industry and clubs get pilloried for not having someone in place ready to go. But if someone's in there in, the, in place ready to go too quickly, it seems it's deemed a little insensitive, isn't it? But purely from a professional point of view, as you quite rightly say, Stanley, that something good has to come of this situation, doesn't it? And bringing Steve in with his pedigree, with his track record... Fingers crossed it works out for him. And, of course, Liam Richardson, who is a, a man that we've both got a, lot, a hell of a lot of time for. So we're keen to see where he next plots up. Um, a team passing Rotherham by on the way um, between the two divisions is, of course, 
Portsmouth. Who needs Mourinho when you've got Moussinho? Was the <laughs> shout coming out of the Pompey dressing room and the scenes that we saw after the game. Safe to say there was a celebration down on the south coast. Yeah, and uh, well-deserved because it's yes. been quite the season for them and it's been quite the, the the few years for them as well, hasn't it, at Portsmouth with a lot of false dawns since those uh, heady Premier League and FA Cup winning days. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm pleased for John, first of all, because when we chatted to him on the pod mm. earlier in the season, he was a great, uh, a great lad to have on here. A very and impressive individual, isn't he? Indeed, indeed. And, mm. and he admitted, he was very honest, wasn't he, that Portsmouth took a real risk, if you like, in hiring him. Mm. Uh, when he, he joined Portsmouth as, as manager, he was actually still a player. Um, they, they sort of plucked him in and said, right, we, we want you to, to manage the team. Mm-hmm. And there was no proof it was going to work. And indeed, we'll talk in a bit about clubs who've taken a gamble on managers yeah. and it hasn't worked. So fair play to him. He's really dug in. He's made the job his own. Um, and he admitted to you, didn't he, that uh, that he hated coming to Fratton Park as a player because he always came <laughs> as an away player. Yeah. And he said it's a horrible place to come because the crowd is so vocal and yeah. really behind their team. And he said, well, I've got to harness that. I've got to keep the fans with me. I've got to yeah. produce football befitting of the atmosphere at Fratton Park. He's certainly done that. And he's ridden the waves of, of injuries galore mm-hmm. throughout the course of the season and still kept them away from, let's let's be honest, not just average to poor teams. We're talking yeah. big clubs who've done very well, the likes of Derby and Bolton and Peterborough mm-hmm. and, and many more below them. So congratulations to him and to the club as a whole. Well, you mentioned Derby, Bolton and Peterborough. Who, who goes up with them then through the automatic <laughs> spots? Well, I mean... <laughs> Derby, uh, obviously, with the three-point advantage over Bolton, are in a in a great spot. But I was looking at, at who who plays who towards the end of the the season. Derby go away to Cambridge and they finish at home to Carlisle. Carlisle, mm. of course, already down. Cambridge still in the mix for relegation, although they they may just be okay. Yeah. Uh, Bolton home to Port Vale, who are scrapping for their lives. Um, it's it's just not working for them and Darren Moore at the moment. Mm-hmm. They're three points adrift of safety now, but that game is going to be huge for both clubs. And Bolton finish at Peterborough. So, <laughs> I mean, we could see Bolton against Peterborough now at the end of yeah. the season. We could see it again in the playoffs or, yes. or or maybe one of them will avoid that. We'll, we'll see. So, yeah, it's it's a cra- it's another crazy end. We've got some wonderful weeks ahead in the EFL. Yeah. And, uh, and when people ask me, why do you enjoy working on the EFL? Well, you just have to look at scenarios like this and it tells its own story. Really. It's crazy, isn't it? Um, down at the bottom... Cometh the hour, cometh the man. Curtis Davis, the old war horse that he is. <laughs> and I'm saying that tongue firmly in cheek because he's in immaculate shape for a man of his age. <laughs> <laughs> but when we spoke to Daryl Clark on the pod as well, haven't we? The belief pouring out of that man about getting Cheltenham away from trouble. They're now just below Burton, just below that dotted line. They do have a game in hand. It's looking very favourable. Obviously, the work needs to be done. Points on the board, potentially better than games in hand, of course. But what looked like the impossible job and what Daryl has said publicly, it would be his greatest achievement in football if he gets them to safety, is well within touching distance, isn't it? It is. And uh, it's funny at this time of the season, you look at league tables and it would be a lot easier to read if everyone had played the same number of games. But of course, postponements and cup commitments and various other things mean that that isn't always the case. And that game in hand, there'll be some Cheltenham Town fans who'll be looking at and saying, we're not going to win the game in hand. Mm. We're, you know, it's, it's, it's too nervous, too yeah. worried about what's going to happen and they'll, they'll feel that it won't happen. There'll be some Cheltenham Town fans who'll be like, of course we're going to win it. That's three <laughs> points. And you add that on and we're above the line. And, and then there's people in the middle who don't really know what's going to go on. And it, it's, it's, a, it's a scary time of the season and it's yeah. a very difficult time to read things, isn't it? And um, yeah, I mean, Ch- Cheltenham winning the other night and leapfrogging Port Vale, it's huge psychologically for them. So um, it sets up the end for them nicely and Burton Albion fans will be concerned looking firmly over the shoulder. Very worried indeed. League two, we've got three teams boxed off. Three teams have done it. The three teams that statistically have been there all the time. We see Stockport reacting to playoff heartache. Mansfield um, with the great work, as we mentioned, Nigel Clough's been doing for such a long time there, and quite rightly lauded as as the best manager in that particular division. And Wrexham, I mean, have we spoken about Wrexham at all this season? <laughs> Possibly a couple of times. But the, the, the chat about it, about, well, they are very um, successful football clubs. They have uh, well um, run. They've, they've got uh, financial resources to draw on. 
yep, all those things on paper, brilliant. Still got to do it on the pitch. And all three have absolutely done that with Belzer, haven't they? Yeah, there's a pressure that goes with that finance, yeah. isn't there? And and it's it's not all that easy to get the job done. It it might be easier than some have it. But uh, yeah, congratulations to, to all three of the clubs who've got up. I think uh, I went to one of the games that stands out for me in the whole season is um, the game when Stockport County were at home to Wrexham and everyone was yes. sort of billing it as a, a title um, decider already. This was in September. Yeah. Um, and uh, and people thought it would be close. Uh, Paul Mullen was playing his 100th game for Wrexham. So a lot of people were joining the dots and saying he's going to star and, and, mm. and win it for for, for Wrexham and Stockport won 5 0. And <laughs> it really put a marker down from the home side. Mm. Isaac Alafe got a hat trick, his first senior hat trick. It was a great day for the Hatters. And I remember um, that Rob McElhenney, the, the co owner of Wrexham, sent a message to Phil Parkinson, a text message to, to Phil Parkinson during the game. Mm. He said so that when Phil got back to the, the locker room, as he calls it, um, he would pick up this message on his phone. Yeah. And it was basically so that he ignored all the external noise about the result. And it was a message that said, we're right behind you. Shake this one off. We wow. go again tomorrow, which you don't get a lot from owners necessarily. It's it amazing. It no? isn't publicized. And it was a case of saying, okay, this is a bad day, but yeah. we're still Rex and we're still going to get the job done. Let's move on. And and we're, we're backing you. And of course, in the end, it, it has proved that, that Wrexham have got up. And so it's yeah. it's good management. And it's also good management from above with Nigel yeah. Clough. Mansfield having a couple of goes at, mm-hmm. at playoffs and automatic promotion in the last few years, yeah. losing the final at Wembley, missing out on goals, uh, goal difference last season, or goal scored, wasn't it, even from Salford. Yeah. And Mansfield, rather than saying, that's the end of the road, Nigel, thanks very much, they gave him another contract and said, mm-hmm. come on, we'll do it this time. We believe in you. Um and clearly Stockport believe in Dave Challoner and rightly yeah. so, and he'll he'll manage in the third tier for the first time in his career and his promotion list goes on and on. So so Seriously. well done to all three. No, it's wonderful to see. There was a touching moment, of course, I said about Nigel thanking his wife on stage at the EFL Awards, but when John Moussinio came up as, as a man in his first full season, um, discussing what it's like and then looking across the table and seeing Nigel Clough a quarter of a century in and a, a statistic that I've read about he's now managed more games than his father and he, 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 he what did he say about what about staying in the game so he said must be something in the genes which I thought was such a such yeah, a, a great line because it's a great line that, because a lot of people talk yeah. about Brian Clough don't they and and, yeah. and, and Nigel and, and and Brian is is rightly so held in, in such high regard for for his demeanor as well as mm. his his management style and his achievements yeah. but Nigel has done exceptionally well and yeah. uh, and you know I think the football world should be very proud of him yeah. what he's achieved and uh, and indeed the, the family as a, as, as a collective if you like yeah very well put very well put unfortunately we're going to have to head down to the bottom end of league two seven seasons in the EFL as high as league one but Forest Green unfortunately next season they've dropped out of the EFL um, and in so many ways a, 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 a very admirable football club in, in the as the entity isn't it really what Dale Vince is trying to do, what he wants from that particular um, business that he's got, from the from what it means to people. Changes in management, changes in structure. I'm not saying necessarily that they then catch up with you, but it's been tumultuous to say the least, hasn't it, this season? It has, and it's no surprise really that clubs that go down mm. are often the teams that have had no stability through the season yeah. or, or very little. And They've been in the bottom two for most of the season. They've only won nine of 44 games. So the writing's been on the wall for a, a long time. Um, they've had three managers since the summer. Um, yeah. When you think, you know, Duncan Ferguson was involved. He, he was um, he, he left in July. Then David Horseman came in, only saw four wins, left in December. Troy Deeney lasted just six games. Mm. Steve Cottrell brought in in January. And, and he actually won more games in his first 14 matches, I think, in charge than the three previous managers managed in 27 between them. So there was a real upturn in form, but there was still a lot to do. And then other teams around them were were picking up form as well. And I I feel for the fans of the club, really, because the National League is such a tough league to get out of. It's got some really good teams in it. And a lot of there's a lot of football snobbery, I think, around the lower leagues of the EFL and also the National League. But... There are some well-drilled sides. There are some sides with real finance behind them. And I'm not just talking Wrexham, but obviously other clubs, you know, yeah. who, who've got money, more money than League Two clubs. So to get out of there is so tough. And when you think of two seasons back, Forest Green Rovers and Exeter City were fighting at the top of League Two 
to try and get up into League One. Yeah. And on the final day, Forest Green nicked the title out of Exeter's hands, if you like, on goal difference. Yeah. The last two seasons, Exeter have spent consolidating in League One and Forest Green have gone down twice. Yeah. And it, it, it comes down in the end to stability mm-hmm. at the two clubs, I guess, if you compare them. Um, a bit of fortune along the way, but also recruitment is huge. And mm-hmm. it's just not worked for, for Dale Vincent, Forest Green Rovers. And I, you know, obviously I wish the club well. He never liked yeah. to lose clubs from the EFL, but we have to do it. Mm-hmm. And it, I just wonder how long they'll be down there in the National League and how they can structure things so that yeah. they can get back up swiftly. Hopefully the bullishness and the skill of Steve Cottrell will be the thing that drags them up by the bootstraps. Um, so it's just Sutton and Colchester. I mean, you could, you could, I mean, it would take an almighty swing to have Grimsby involved at that come the end of the season, wouldn't it? Let's be honest. But Colchester again with the games in hand, um, they're, they're they're flying way too close to the sun for any form of comfort, aren't they? And, and potentially, if it ends up being them staying up, lots of things for them to work on, lots of of of, of things to put in place to make sure that next season is not the same as it was this season. Yeah, it's been a really interesting battle at the bottom. Mm. And let's not forget that you mentioned Grimsby. They're six points clear of the, the, the drop zone with two games left to play for Sutton and for, for uh, Colchester. Obviously, got the game in hand. Mm-hmm. So it would take quite a swing. But there's only an eight-goal difference between Sutton and Grimsby Town in goal difference. So that that could happen. Yeah, uh, But it's also worth mentioning Salford City, only a point better off than Grimsby. Yeah. Now, they can't yeah. go down. But there'll be a big debrief at the end of the season about what on earth are Salford doing down there mm. with the backing they've got and the, yeah. the you know the, the the footballing brains behind the operation there. Mm. So that's that's one to point out as well. But Sutton host Crawley and they end at MK Dons, and Colchester go to Knotts and then are home to Donny and Crew. Um, Colchester might not get any more points well, when you look the form at their that Donny are in as well. But wow. they, yeah, but they might not need to. That's that's yeah. the thing. They're, they're four points ahead of Sutton, so. Uh, you know, it, it it might all be done. We we don't know, um, but yeah, it's given us plenty of plenty of drama and excitement. Unless, of course, you are fans of the teams at the bottom, when which it's <laughs> been an awful ride, and you just want it to all be over. <laughs> I just want it to end, <laughs> which is not what I want for this podcast. I don't want it to end, Stanley, but I've got to because you've got to go. You've been wonderfully uh, astute company as ever. We'll let you into a little secret. You listeners and, and watchers, we did have Sammy Smodix for a little longer than we normally get with the guests, as he was uploading, as I said, in this car park up in the northwest. <laughs> and he's a lovely chap, isn't he? He gave us a, a lot more of the time than he ever needed to. We had a good chat with him. So I think myself and you uh, have become his best friends. So yeah, well, yeah, that. and it's worth pointing out as well, which I, we, we didn't get to in the chat, but he scored 24 championship goals this season and no penalties. Amazing. So, fair play to the lad. Great fair return. Play to him. He was wonderful. And so are you, my friend. Where are you on your travels this weekend? Uh, I'm. I've got a few bits and bobs this week, but I'm. Uh, I'm going to take in a bit of League One at the weekend, which I'm mm-hmm. looking forward to to okay. see uh, basically who gets into those playoff spots or who can make a move towards those playoff spots. So I, I look forward to uh, to taking in the action and, and being on some TV screens somewhere. I think. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing your face. <laughs> You're too kind. You take care, my friend. <laughs> So, my sincere thanks to our very own David Stowell and, of course, the goal machine that is Sammy Smodix. If you've enjoyed this episode, then please give us a follow in all the usual places or watch us right here on YouTube. My name's David Prutton and I'll see you same time next week for another episode of the official EFL Podcast.